Okay, uh, welcome back everyone to the last lecture. Uh, so now we're going to finally talk about bandit convex optimization, which was uh, you know, the title for the four lectures, but it's actually really only for the last one. So this is really going to be a, a vast generalization of what we did just before lunch on, on uh, bandit linear optimization. So here is the, the framework. So we have a convex body K in Rn, as always. Now, we're not going to, we worried a lot about the convex body before. Now we're not going to worry too much about it. You can just think, you know, it's a Euclidean ball for everything I'm talking about. And the game goes like this. So at every t, at every time step t in 1 to capital T. As a player, the player picks uh, xt at random from uh, pt. And maybe let me say I pick uh, at, that would be nicer, at random from pt. And the adversary picks um, lt which is now a convex function. Also, let me, instead of k as before, let's write script k, because I'm going to use a capital K for something else very soon, which is convex and one Lipschitz. OK, the Lipschitz uh, assumption doesn't matter too much, but it will just allow us to simplify a little bit. OK, so again, the picture is that we have this ball, this convex body. The adversary picks a convex function on it. We pick a point, and we just see the value of this convex function at this point. Okay, so then it feedback. It's just LT of AT. Okay, but let's see already before talking about bandit. Let's talk about full information, and let's see that the full information game is actually very easy. So two reduction to linear, uh, let's say to holo. Okay, so I write holo for online linear optimization and uh, uh, BCO for bandit convex optimization. Reduction to holo with full information. So this reduction uh, appeared first in a very famous paper by Zinkevich uh, in 2003. But you will see it's really, really simple. I mean, this is you know in the thousands of uh, citations by now. But it's, it's a simple thing. So what is our regret? Our regret is the sum of LT of AT minus LT of X. OK, this is our regret. Sum for T equals 1 to capital T. Now, remember what is the, the definition of convexity. Right, convexity, one definition is that the Function should always be above its tangent. Okay, so if, if we have a point here, at, and we have another point, x, then we know that uh, lt of x is larger than lt of at plus grad lt of at in a product with x minus at. Okay, so put it another way, we have we have this, we have lt minus uh, of at minus lt of x, this is upper bounded by the sum for t equals 1 to capital T of the gradient of lt at at in a product with at minus x. Okay. The way to understand this inequality is very simple. Imagine that as, a, as an adversary, I'm playing this convex function. And the player played this point. If I know that you played this point, then in fact I would have been better off by playing a linear function. Because I can play this linear function and I'm just making the loss of every other point smaller while keeping your loss to be the same. Okay? So clearly, from the adversary perspective, in full information, it just makes sense to play linear function. It's the best you can do. Okay? And this is witnessed by this inequality. 
So now you can just assume, so now it's a linear game where the adversary is playing grad LT of AT. Okay? So this is equivalent to linear game with loss. Um, maybe, I sh maybe let me write XT here to make clear that here XT is not random with loss grad LT of XT. So in particular, I can run, you know, gradient descent, let's say, uh, on these linear losses, and I will get my regret bound. Let me just see if I want to say something else in this. Mm. Yeah, no, that's what I want to say. Okay, so, but this is for full information. Yes? Yeah. No, 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 okay, so good. Uh, so let's say, yes, good. So by full information, what I meant was actually you observe the full loss function. But now you see with this reduction, it's enough to assume that you just observe the gradient of the loss at the point at which you play. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. But now you see that this reduction fails in the bandit case, because in the bandit case, you observe you know, information, as was just pointed out right now, about the function value, whereas here what you need is information about the gradient. So the question is, how do you move from information about the function value to information about the gradient? Okay, so that's one way to do it, and, and this is uh, the way uh, the problem was done first. So this is BCO, bandit convex optimization, via small perturbations. So the idea will be to, to just do small perturbations, uh, and using small perturbation, you can estimate the gradient using a function value. Okay, so this was done in Kleinberg, these are also the paper introducing the problem. Kleinberg, 2004, and Flaxman, Kalai, McMahon, in 2005. Okay, but these, these are the same, the same ideas. And we'll see that what they will get is a suboptimal bound, and we will work hard to make, to make the algorithm optimal. Uh, let me say one more say, thing about this reduction. It's interesting to think about it from an information theoretic perspective. So you see, in terms of pure loss, even in bandit, the adversary still has an advantage to play a linear function. So the only thing that the adversary must, I mean, the thing that the adversary must be thinking is that there is, uh, he has an incentive to curve the loss function so that he, he, he confuses you more. So he's trading off, you know, making some point worst so that you get less information, okay? Uh, I wish I knew how to make this intuition formal, and in particular, we saw, okay, so let me just say a conjecture right away. So remember, recall, for BLO, bandit linear optimization, we got n square root t, okay? This was using the entropic barrier. Now, my conjecture, is that for BCO, the optimal regret should be of order n to the 3 half square root t. Okay, and we will see why I conjecture this in, in this lecture uh, from the upper bound side. So we don't know, we know neither the lower bound nor the upper bound. Okay, in particular, we don't know a separation between BCO and BLO. Uh, we, we cannot say at this point that BCO is harder than BLO. But I think it is, I think the adversary can really trade off, you know, making some loss a little bit worse by, doing a, by using a convex function. Just why, why can he confuse us with a convex function? Well, if he was playing a linear function, when, then we can do this one-point linear regression that we talked about before lunch. So what he's doing is that by curving the function, he, you know, he forbids us from using this very nice estimator, for, from using, you know, some kind of algebraic structure. Um, how do you exploit this uh, in an information theoretic argument? I don't know, but I think it's doable. And so the, the, upper bound, the lower bound is a really, uh, you know, it's an approachable problem. Uh, proving the upper bound will be difficult, but we will talk about it. Okay, so let's do first this uh, very simple idea. Um, so, okay. So let's say, uh, what do we want? So, just like before, we would like to have an unbiased estimator now not of the function, but of the gradient, okay? 
So say we play AT from PT with mean uh, XT. And using uh, LT of AT, somehow we built a non-biased estimator. I will, I will explain. We build uh, GTLT such that the expectation when AT is sampled from PT of GTLT is equal to the gradient of LT at XT. Let's say we can do that. Okay? We won't be able to do this exactly, but let's say we can do it. Just uh, uh, to have some kind of intuition on what's going on, let's say you, know, you have a one-dimensional function. You want to estimate the gradient, the tangent here. What you could do is you can just you know, play with priority a half a point very close to the left and with priority a half a point very close to the right. And you know, in expectation, if you put the appropriate sign, the, this, will be, this will give you the derivative. Okay, so I will explain that in, uh, in more details in a minute, but this is the intuition. So let's say we, you can do that. Then what do we want to do? Then um, let me just think if I want to explain something else. OK. Then play gradient descent uh, with GTLT. OK, so what does it mean? It means you were at XT, and now you do a small step in the direction of GTLT. OK, so XT plus 1 is equal to this. So how do you analyze this? Well, uh, the sum for T equals 1 to capital T of in expectation uh, LT of AT minus LT of X. This is a regret that you want to control. So you will have one term which will, be, which will come from the fact that you don't play XT exactly, but you play a small perturbation. So that's why I say that we do BCO with small perturbation right now. So this is upper bounded using the Lipschitzness by the expectation for the sum for T equals 1 to capital T of LT of XT minus LT of X plus the norm of AT minus XT, uh, the Euclidean norm. Okay? So if this term is small, if we do small perturbation, let's say we can ignore this term. Okay? So now we have to worry about this term. This term, what, what is it? Well, by convexity, I just said it's smaller than the gradient of LT at XT in a product with XT minus X. Now, in expectation, I just told you that we built G till T so that in expectation it's a gradient. So the expectation of this is equal to the expectation of G till T in a product with X T minus X. Okay, and now we're good because now this is the regret as if the adversary was playing G till T as a linear function. So if we run mirror descent or gradient descent, what we will get is that the sum of those terms, so let me write the sum, sum uh, for this part. Uh, and what was this? was an inequality, equality. So now, just by the analysis of mirror descent or gradient descent, what we'll get is the usual thing. We'll get uh, the size of the set over eta plus eta times the sum of the norm of the gradients. In expectation. Okay? So you see, as always, the, the key thing to do is to control the variance of those, uh, uh, of those unbiased estimators. Now, the difficulty between, of, of bandit convex optimization is the following. Because we have this term okay, that, that says that you shouldn't play too far, it means that you're lacking space everywhere. Okay, so remember, in, linear, in bandit linear optimization, the, difficulty, the whole difficulty was that when you get close to the corner, you have less and less space to do the sampling. So the covariance would go to zero, so the inverse covariance would blow up. Okay? And to combat this inverse covariance blowing up, we had to work with a barrier function. Okay? So this was the key pr problem of bandit linear optimization, is that close to the corner, you don't have much space. But now in BCO, there is no space everywhere. Every, per every point is like its own corner. You cannot move far away because of this term. Because you know, intuitively, if you move far away, then you're not going to get relevant information to compute the gradient. Okay? 
So this, this fact is really what prevented uh, progress you know, from, from 2004 to 2016, that we didn't know how to deal with this. And the key new idea will be to change our notion of space. Okay? If there is no space anywhere, then okay, it seems difficult to do anything. But what we're going to do is that we will have a way to, um, there will be region of space that matters more to us. And what we're going to do is that this region of space, we're going to expand them. And then, you know, what, 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 what looked small is going to look big. And then, okay, you will have more space. This is very, very informal at this point. But let's see already what, what you can get out of this. Okay? You will see. It will all make sense uh, if, you, if you listen. Okay, so let's do uh, a one-point uh, unbiased estimator of the gradient. And maybe just, uh, I don't know, let's just, do it, uh, let's just do it directly in high dimension. So let me remind you the divergence uh, theorem. So the divergence theorem tells you that if you want to integrate over some set omega, the divergence of some potential v, then you might as well integrate over the surface the inner product between V and the normal. And this is going to be the surface measure. Okay, so I, I, I don't want to redefine all those terms, uh, but this is a divergence, okay, so the, the sum of the derivative with respect to each coordinate. And uh, this is the surface measure. So you, go, you got the surface, you, you know, expand it a little bit, and you look at this measure, how does it behave when you rescale by, by epsilon. Okay, so this is the divergence theorem. So now I want to tell you a lemma using this. So let me denote, I will denote by B, it's going to be the Euclidean ball. It's going to be the set uh, of point X in Rn such that uh, uh, the norm of X is less than 1. OK, so if I take the expectation of the gradient of some function uh, f over u, when u is taken from this, from b. So when I write u taken from b, I mean u is uniform at random from this set. Okay. This is equal to n times the expectation when v is sampled from the boundary of the ball, so from the sphere of f of b times b. So what is this saying? This is saying you can think of this, think of b as a small ball. Okay, right now it's a ball of unit size, but it doesn't matter. This is like the gradient of a smooth version of my function. And what I'm telling you is that you can find the gradient of this smooth version of your function using a function, just a function evaluation. Okay, and this, this, uh, the proof of this is just using the divergence theorem. So let me write it. Okay, maybe maybe let me just uh, do it in one dimension to be clear. So, you know, um, f prime of x. This is okay. It's a limit when epsilon tends to zero of uh, f of x plus epsilon uh, minus, uh, what do I want to say? Am I saying this correctly? Uh, what do I want to say? I just want to say, I'm doing something wrong. Uh, two epsilon, thanks. Okay, so this is, this is what this is doing. Okay. Except that now I don't have the renormalization by 1 over epsilon because I looked at the smooth version. Okay, so this is saying either do a small step to the left or a small step to the right, you know, we put the half. Okay, so let's do the proof of the lemma. Uh, so let me... So what I want to say is, let me denote v 
is going to be f of x times little v. Oh, I see. I'm using v too many times. Uh, let's say this is f. Okay, so this is capital F. For some v in Rn. Okay, so the divergence here, the divergence of f is nothing but the gradient of f in the direction v. Okay, so if I apply the divergence theorem, I get that the integral over b of grad f of x, uh, sorry, inner product with v, grad f of x inner product with v, dx, this is equal to the integral over the sphere uh, b of what is it? Of f of x. So grad f of x times v uh, n d sigma x. But what is the normal, you know, on a ball? The normal on a ball is just x. Okay, so this is because n is equal to x on the ball. Okay, and now that, that, that's it. I just showed to you, you know, that in every direction, if I take the inner product of this, it's equal to the inner product of this guy with b. Now, there is this n factor, which is just a normalization. Okay, you have to be a little bit careful. If you want to, you see, this measure, here I need to divide by 1 over the volume of b to have a measure. Here I need to divide by 1 over the volume, I mean, the n minus 1 volume of uh, n minus 1 dimensional volume of the sphere. And the volume of the ball and the volume of the sphere, they are related by a factor n. You know, it's just this, uh, whatever, integration by part. When you want to integrate the volume here, you know, you will integrate over this ball. But uh, each one of them, when, when you do the integration, the volume of that guy, it's r to the n minus 1 times the volume of a sphere, times the n minus 1 dimensional volume of the boundary of B. So because you have this r to the n minus 1, that will give you the 1 over n. Okay, again, this is basic uh, geometry, but uh, so let's not do it. But this n factor just comes from the normalization. Okay, so we get our lemma. Now, how are we going to use it? So now the idea is just play. So idea. Is it clear, by the way? Is there a question? So now the idea is play at which is going to be our xt plus epsilon, uh, let's call it vt, where vt is uh, uniform from the boundary of a ball, okay? so from a sphere. Then what do you observe? You observe lt of at. And I claim that lt of v at times vt normalized by epsilon, then the expectation of this is nothing but the expectation of the gradient of lt at xt plus, uh, plus u, plus epsilon u, where u is uniform from a ball. Okay. So this thing, is going to be your estimator of the gradient, and its expectation is equal to the expectation of the gradient. Why do you have this 1 over epsilon? It's just, uh, you know, the change of variable, because here I have epsilon u. So now, you see, I don't get exactly what I wanted. What I wanted, uh, of course, I just erased it. What I wanted was the expectation of g tilde would be the gradient of lt at xt. Now, we don't find exactly the gradient of lt at xt, but the gradient of lt at xt plus epsilon u. So we, we find a, a small, you know, this is basically a convolution of your losses with a small ball. So let me define this more precisely. So let l bar t at the point x to be the expectation when u is sampled from a ball of lt of x plus epsilon u. Notice by, that by Lipschitzness, 
the difference between L bar T and L T is just epsilon. Okay, so if epsilon is tiny, there is essentially no difference between L bar T and L T. And what we just proved is that with G tilde T, which is L T of A T in the direction V T, normalized by epsilon, the expectation of G tilde T is exactly equal to the gradient of L bar T at X T. Okay, that's what we proved. So again, just to, to clarify, what you're doing, it's a, it's a bit weird, you know. You're taking a random direction. You're going to step in a random direction. The only question is, by how much do you step? Okay, and you step by, you see your loss. If you see a big loss, then you step, you know, far. You step far away from this point. It looked like it was a bad point. And you renormalize by 1 over epsilon. <coughs> if it's a good point, then, you know, if your loss is close to 0, then you don't move too much. It's kind of a very jittery algorithm. In particular, you see that because it's very jittery, remember the very first lecture, you want stability. Okay? To have a good regret bound, you want to have stability. This is not going to be very stable, so it's not going to have a great regret bound. So let's see what is the regret bound exactly. So the only thing that I need to say is this is my regret, but what I can do is my, so this was my, my regret was equal to this, but in fact it's upper bounded by this where I put a bar and I just put plus epsilon t. Okay? I just, you know, I can replace lt by l bar t, the smooth version, up to an epsilon. Now, this distance is also epsilon. Okay, so when I sum, I get also an epsilon t. So my regret, I find that my regret doing this, up to some constant, I get epsilon t plus 1 over eta plus eta t times the variance. What is the variance of this thing? So it's the Euclidean norm squared of this guy. Vt is a unit norm direction. This is between 0 and 1, so the norm of this is just 1 over epsilon squared. So I get this divided by epsilon squared. Okay, that's the regret that I get for this algorithm. Um, so this is gradient descent with a one-point uh, estimator of the gradient. But you see, when I will do the, the optimization, it doesn't look very good. Right? Because I have now those two parameters, epsilon and eta, and okay, let's, let's do it, but it doesn't smell very good. I'm probably going to do a mistake when I do the optimization. Uh, okay, so let's optimize over eta first. So we get epsilon t plus uh, the geometric mean of those two things. So that's square root t over epsilon. So now when I optimize over epsilon, I get the geometric mean of those two things. So that's like square root of t square root t. So t to the 3 half, so that's t to the 3 quarter. Oh, and of course I forgot an n. Doesn't really matter for what we want to say, but uh, I forgot this n that I told you about. So there should be an n here. Uh, an n here. So my variance, it has an n. Uh, and it's an n squared. It's an n squared because I'm looking at the norm squared. So when I optimize, I get an n here. And I get a square root n here. Okay, so I get n to the 1 half, t to the 3 quarter. n doesn't really matter. The, the big picture here is that the dependency on t, the time horizon, is 3 quarter. Okay, and we spend uh, 8 hours having regret bounds which are like square root t. So at this point, you should be disappointed. Okay, this is not good, t to the 3 quarter. And the reason why it's not good is because we're not doing anything smart. I mean, you know, there is no way this was going to work. Because you're not exploiting space anywhere. You're always being very local. So the way I like to think about this is that what you're doing here is microscopic propagation of information. So you got information at one point, and it told you something just about the points very cl close by. And if you want to have any hope to get square root t, you need to do macroscopic propagation of information. You need that the function value at one point is telling you about points which are far away. But this seems very difficult in, in, in banded convex optimization because, you know, this convex function, you don't know where is the curvature. Just using one point, you know what can you do. So the, 
my way of thinking about it is that, okay, there is no way around this. You need to be microscopic. So let's change our definition of what space means. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. And another way to, to think about it is that this is a, a convolution, okay, and we're going to do uh, an adaptive convolution. There is no reason why this epsilon could not depend on x. So essentially, the key new idea will, will be to have an epsilon which depends on x. So at places where your algorithm is likely to play, we will have an epsilon which is small, and at other places, we will have a big epsilon. Okay, so that's, that's what we're going to do for the rest uh, of today. Is there, is there any question on, uh, on this one, on this part? Okay, so this, yeah. So what you're saying, you can make an adaptive set, right? Yeah. You change. To the point, you make an adaptive, uh, yes, you, you, it, it's going to be adaptive, yes, yes. Epsilon is going to change over time and over space also. Um, maybe one, one other thing that I can say is that, okay, so the community got stuck on this problem for, for 10 years, and the first progress was using the information theoretic argument that I showed to you in the first uh, lecture. And using the information theoretic argument, we were able to prove that, you know, information theoretically, you can get square root t. But there was no algorithm that comes with it. You know, it was just, okay, it, you know, th this is a proof that you can do square root t, but there was no algorithm. So it was a bit disappointing. Then a year later, there is a paper by Elal Hazan and Yuan Jili uh, who gave an algorithm, uh, but the dependency was exponential in the dimension. And the, the algorithm is inspired, if you want, by the uh, by cutting plane method, but it's a very, very uh, clever uh, construction based on, on cutting plane method, but the dependency was exponential in the dimension. What I'm going to tell you now is a polynomial time algorithm, which gets a polynomial dependency on the dimension, n square root t. The dependency on the dimension is n to the 9.5. Okay, and we'll see where those uh, 9.5 come from. Uh, it's not like we didn't try to optimize. And the conjecture, remember, is n to the 1.5. Okay, so there is a lot of room to improve. Kernel based method for BCO. And this is a paper by uh, myself, Ronan Eldan, and Yin Tatli uh, from last year. <coughs> okay, so let's let's think again about this, this step, okay? This step which looks like a minor step, but it's, it's actually important. So, L bar t, what was L bar t at the point x? So we have this function, uh, this is L t, and what we were doing is that we were integrating this function against you know, something very picky, like a small ball around epsilon. So let me just see how I want to phrase this. Okay, just like this, okay. So what we did is that we took this function and we integrated it, integrated against some kind of kernel like, that looks like this. So if this was our point, okay, let me call it y. This is the value at y. So we integrate this function against something that looks like this. Okay, and this is of width epsilon. Or square root epsilon, it doesn't matter. Epsilon square root epsilon. Okay? So really it was, it was like a, a uniform on a small ball around this point. But in high dimension, if I project on a direction, you know, the, you know this, that... If I, if I have the measure on the ball and I project in a direction, then what I see is a Gaussian. Okay. So this is why, why I'm drawing it like this. So what we were doing is the, our function L bar t at y, it was just integrated against this thing. 
So this, we will view it as a kernel. This is a kernel, k dot y. And the key new idea will be to change, you know, to have a more general kernel, to change the kernel so that maybe, you know, maybe at some, at some point like this, it's very picky, but maybe at this point, it's going to be, you know, a bigger width. So the width is going to be adaptive to the point where we are. And how am I going to make this choice? Well, the way I'm going to make this choice is that we're going to play in the background some randomized strategy, which is going to be continuous exponential weight. And the way I should think about it is we have our body. We said we have no space anywhere. But one thing that happens is that there, is, there are regions where there is more mass. Okay, so my exponential weights right now, maybe they are telling me that this region of space is where I'm more likely to play. And those regions, I'm less likely to play. So what I'm going to do is that I will have a kernel which is very picky in this region and, you know, very wide in those regions. So it's going to be adaptive to where I play. And I want to say that, okay, now we're going to work hard to make this mathematically rigorous and, uh, and you know, there will be nice things that, that comes out of it. But just this idea, I think it's pretty practical. You know, you, you could imagine using this. You have some uncertainty about where the optimum is and, you know, you're, you're trying to explore your space. And what you want to say is that when you pick a value in a region that you don't explore often, you want to make this value count. You know, you don't want to say, okay, I'm so rarely playing over here. When I see something, I need to tell, you know, everybody in a, in a big neighborhood about these values that I observed. Whereas when I'm playing in a region where I play a lot, okay, I can afford to be much more localized. So this, I think, could, could have applications elsewhere. Um, okay. So that's what we're going to do now. So what is going to be my kernel? So kernel k is going to be a map from, uh, let's say, kappa across kappa, my convex body, to R plus. Uh, and I, view, I will view this as a linear map over measures. So view k, the kernel, as a linear map. over measures. And what I mean by this is the following. So how does it act on a measure Q? So let's say I have a measure Q on my set. What is the kernel applied to this measure Q? Well, this, it will have a density. So, you know, the density of this at a point uh, X, this is going to be equal to the integral of K of XY, QY, dy. Okay, so this is the way uh, this thing acts. And of course here it's dq over dy if you want. Okay, so you just integrate this density against this uh, kernel. So again, just to clarify, if you had, you know, a measure which is, I don't know, like this, and maybe, you, you know, I want to know what is the, va the value of kq at this point. What I would need to look at is k of x dot. Okay, so this is the point x. And maybe k of x dot is something like this. Then kq at this point would be, you know, the average of q over this window. That's, that's all what it means, this kernel. But I like to think of it as, as a linear map over measures because then it comes equipped with an adjoint. Okay, so now we're working with continuous things. So let me uh, denote my inner product f, fg. It's the L2 inner product, so it's the integral of f of x, g of x, dx. Uh, and let me be a little bit uh, carefree also with respect to densities, measures, low random variable. Uh, so this is bad to do that, but it's really going to make, I think, the discussion cleaner. So I'm just going to assume all of these things is the same. Okay, so I write the same letter for all of these things. And if it confuses you, at some point, ask me. Uh, so in particular, I won't write dkq over dx anymore. I will just write kq 
at x for the density of kq of the measure kq at x. Okay? And if I want, I will say that kq is also a random variable, which is a random variable with that measure. Very good. Uh, so now I just said that uh, k as an adjoint. K star that acts on functions. And this is exactly going to be this guy. So um, K star applied to F at the point X. Uh, this is equal at the point Y. This is equal to the integral of F of X, K of X, Y, uh, DX. Again, okay, it's the adjoint because if I take, if I integrate, uh, let's see which order I want to take, just so that I keep it always, um, kq, okay. So if I integrate kq against f, it's the same thing as integrating q against k star f. Okay. And let me, now that I made my remark about densities and random variables, let me just write kq here and q here. Okay, you can see those formulas are just so that this is true. I mean, this is just in, in terms, it's just an infinite matrix, and you know, the adjoint is just the transpose. That, that's all it is. But now you see that my L bar T before was exactly K star LT, where K star was the kernel, which is just a small width epsilon around every point. Now, if you have been uh, in the bandit business for long enough, you will notice something very, very nice about this identity, which is the following. Here, the way I want you to think about it is that I'm writing k star f as a superposition of these, if you wish, harmonics, k of x dot. So these are the harmonics. And I'm writing it as a decomposition over those functions with amplitudes which are given by the function values, which mean, in turn, that given one observation of the function value, I get a very natural unbiased estimator for k star f. If I just told you f of x, then what you would estimate is, okay, my k star f is f of x times k of x dot, be normalized by the probability of seeing x. So let me say this again. So given x sampled from q, what do we have? If I look at f of x, k of x dot over q of x, then the expectation of this is equal to k star f. So while it seems very hard using a single point to get an unbiased estimator of a convex function, I mean, this is not a question that really makes sense. It's easy to get, using one point, an unbiased estimator of the kernelized version of any function. Now, as always during all those lectures, there is no, you know, it doesn't come for free, these unbiased estimators. The question will be, what is the variance? Okay? And, and what is the variance will depend on the kernel, will depend on many things, so we'll have to work hard with this. Okay? But here there is an added difficulty. Not only what is the variance, but also why, why do I care about an unbiased estimator of k star f? What I care about is f or LT, the loss. Okay, so let's see, let's already deal with this first problem, which is not an easy problem. What does it mean that we get, you know, a non-based estimator of a kernelized loss when we care about the original loss? And again, please ask me questions. <laughs> if, uh, you know, these are, it, uh, it's non-standard, so, you know, it's, uh, you can slow me down by asking questions if something is not clear. So let's see exactly what I mean by this, uh, uh, how do, to deal with the fact that we don't estimate what we want. Okay, so say we play from QT. Okay, so say we play from QT. Um, what we get is L till T, 
which is Lt of xt applied to kt. I will have a kernel that depends on time at xt dot over uh, q of xt. Okay? So xt is sampled from qt. This is our estimator that we can build using this formula. So the expectation of L till T, this is equal to K star T L T. Now, okay, we get those unbiased estimators. So now we can feed those unbiased estimators into a full information strategy. Maybe something like continuous exponential weight. I could maybe do gradient descent or something, but continuous exponential weight will be useful for something else. So now let PT be a full information strategy with a uh, L tilde uh, 1 up to L tilde t minus 1. So the full information that we, so at this point of the discussion, you can keep it as something abstract, but just if you want to have something in mind, you can take, for instance, uh, PT of x, you know, again, the density at x is proportional to exponential minus eta, the sum for s less or equal than, uh, s strictly less than t of L tilde t s at x. Okay, this is just a, a continuous space version of multiplicative weights. Okay, I just assign to every point instead of having a discrete probability, I now have a density, and the density is this thing. Okay, you can also do the regret bound analysis. It's the usual thing where, where the variance is, uh, is going to be L T square integrated against this. Okay, but the point that matters is not the precise formula. The point is that if you have PT which is uh, on, on those L tilde, then we can hope, we can hope, it's not, it's not, maybe we won't be able to do, it, to do it, but we can hope to control uh, the sum for t equals 1 to capital T of PT minus Q against L tilde T. So for any comparator Q. So this would be the regret, this is the regret of playing the distribution PT when the losses, the true losses are L till T. But what we have is that we're not playing from PT, we're playing from QT. Okay, so, but the regret we care about is the sum for t equals 1 to capital T of qt minus q times lt. This is the regret we care about. And notice, okay, good. Uh, do I want to erase this? Okay, so this is what we can hope to control. What is it in expectation? And is it clear, by the way, that this is a regret? So just with my notation of the inner L2 inner product, this is the same thing as the expectation of, you know, LT of X when I play X from QT. So this expectation is indeed my expected regret. Uh, it's like linearized because I'm, I'm working over, uh, you know, like a continuous space instead of a discrete space as before. So what is this expectation? This expectation is equal to the sum for t equals 1 to capital T of PT minus Q times K star LT. Right? The expectation of LT T is K star LT. Now by definition of the adjoint, I can put it on the other side. So this is equal to the sum for t equals 1 to capital T of kt applied to pt minus q times lt. 
So what we can hope to control, provided that we can do the variance calculation, is this term. You can think that there is the true world, the, the world where I'm playing from QT and the adversary is playing from LT, and there is this virtual world where I can assume the adversary is playing L tilde and, uh, and I'm playing from PT. In this virtual world, the regret really becomes this. It becomes KT applied to PT minus Q times LT. This is what I can hope to control using properties of my full information strategy and the variance of those L tilde. But what I care about is this guy. But now I have some flexibility. I can choose what is QT. So if you look at these two equations, uh, I don't know. Is there a natural QT that, that comes? Not saying it, it will obviously work, but what would be something to try for QT? Exactly, KTPT. Okay, so let's try KTPT. So, idea: play QT. Let's define it to be KTPT. Okay, I play from KTPT, and now I'm looking for an inequality. This is what I want to control, and this is what I know or hope to control. So what would be very nice if, if this quantity was upper bounded by this. Okay. And now I have one more flexibility, which is I didn't design so far the kernel. So now I will design the kernel so that this inequality becomes true. Okay, so uh, um, condition for the kernel. that appear when you do this is that you want, you would like kt pt minus q times lt to be smaller up to maybe some constant than uh, kt applied to pt minus q times lt. Okay, and this is uh, not an easy inequality to think about, I think. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's surprisingly difficult to think about this. Um, but this makes sense that we want this. And you agree that if we add that, then the last step to do, which will be highly non-trivial, will be to control the variance of those L tilde against PT. Okay, maybe let me erase those pictures. Uh, yeah. So let me do some uh, mild rewriting of this inequality to make it a bit more amenable to interpretation. Right now it doesn't look so, so simple. Okay, so what do we want? So let me write it uh, like this. So we want kp minus q, or minus, let's say, a point mass at x. It's enough. If it's true for any point mass, it will be true for any distribution. We want this to be smaller than, let's say, 1 over lambda times uh, k applied to p minus delta x on f, let's say. Let's say we have a function f. Okay, so what is the order of the quantifiers exactly? So we want uh, fix P, okay, a measure, and uh, which is, okay, what is it? It's a measure over kappa, and lambda, which is some real number, we get to choose lambda, okay? So P, P is fixed for us. We don't have a choice over P. Lambda we get to choose. Um, maybe this is not, so given P, maybe this is better. Given P, find lambda and K, the kernel, such that for any convex function, And any point x in k, we have the following inequality. Okay, so 
p is given to us. p, you know, for us, it will come from this exponential weight, continuous exponential weight distribution. Uh, you see, if I if I get if I if I have flexibility to choose lambda, I could choose it very small, and then you know it's easier for me. Yes, exactly, and it will be important for me to choose a small lambda. Yeah. Okay, such so that for any convex function, it has to be for any convex function because I don't control what the adversary is going to play, and any point x because I don't know what is you know I want to apply this to the optimum at the end of the game. And the optimum at the end of the game is some point x. I don't know what it is. I want this inequality to be true. OK, let me do some rewriting of this now. So I put lambda on the other side. I get lambda kp. Now if I bring it back, you know I had 1. And now I find 1 minus lambda kp. Uh, what else do I have? I have when I put this lambda here, I have lambda times f of x. When I put it on the other side, I find plus lambda f of x. And what do I see that I need to put on this side? Well, the only thing which is left is k delta x applied to f. So what is k delta x applied to f? It's just k star f at x. Okay. So this is what I need to verify. So let's see what is the meaning. Now we can start to have some meaning associated to this. I mean, you can also try to have meaning over there, but it's, uh, it's confusing. This, this way is cleaner. So what is k star f? So k star f, uh, we, we understand it. k star f is, I raise the picture, it's the smoothed version of f. Okay? We're going to design the kernel so that it's doing a smoothing, an adaptive smoothing. What we want is that the way this thing is, is smoothing the function, is that at any point x, you know, let's say I have some point x, the way I'm going to, so let's say even I take a very good point. This is x. So when I smooth this, you know, maybe I smooth like this. Okay, so I take the integral of a big window. Then this value is going to be much bigger than the value which was here. But what I want is that this value retains some of the goodness of f. You see? It has to be smaller. Let's imagine that f in, f, x is the minimum of f. Then I want this value to be not too far from the minimum in the sense that I can bring a little bit of kpf. So what is kpf? kpf is the average value that I will get when I play from kp. You know, maybe kp is focused here. Maybe this is kp. So maybe kp is focused on a very bad region for the function f. So this integral is going to be a large value. But what I want is my kernel to be smart enough, to, to spread enough, so that it takes some of the goodness of f here. OK, maybe a good way to think about it, just, just to think, example, think uh, f of x is uh, non-negative, and uh, f, f is non-negative, and f of x is 0. Then what we want is k star f at x to be smaller than 1 minus lambda uh, kpf. OK, so certainly we don't want, uh, OK, let me just see what I want to say exactly. Um, yeah, of course, I didn't write it. So I want to say that there is a trade-off okay, between uh, doing a big smoothing. So let's, let's see the extreme. If we smooth so that the value becomes a constant, okay, if we did a complete integral, then this certainly would not be true because this value would just be equal to this. So it wouldn't have this 1 minus lambda factor shrinking. Okay. On the other hand, if we stay very focused, okay, very peaked, then it's going to be very bad for the variance. So we see that the kernel will have to trade off between you know, being dispersed so that this inequality is true and not being too... Uh, sorry, being, uh, uh, no, this, you want it to be not dispersed. You want it to be more picked so that when I integrate k star f around x, you know, I keep a lot of the goodness of f. So you want it to be picked to satisfy this inequality, but uh, for the variance, you don't want it to be too picked. Okay, so the kernel will have to trade off between those two things. <laughs>
Okay, so if you stare this, so and you see also now that I wrote it like this, you can imagine that convexity is going to be a useful property to have. So let's see how to exploit this with a specific kernel. So here is the next idea. Define k. Uh, with a random variable z. By the following equation, I will ask you that k delta x, so when I apply my kernel to a point mass at x, so you know, in terms of distribution, you can always think of it in many ways. One, one way to think of when you apply, uh, you know, a transformation to a measure is to think in terms of particles, you know. I can think that a measure is just an infinity of particles, samples from this distribution, and I can think how, how this you know, a swarm of particles is evolving. So that's the, way I, I, that's the interpretation I'm taking right now. So let's say I have a particle at x. What kind of evolution am I applying with this kernel k? So what I want to say is this is going to be 1 minus lambda z plus lambda x. The way I want to think about this is that this kernel is doing some kind of exploration for me. So I was at some point x. And now what this is doing is that it's sampling this point z. And what I'm, where I'm putting myself at is 1 minus lambda z plus lambda x. And you see that this will preserve some of, of the goodness of the value x because I preserve some of the you know, sum of x in my kernel. So, so let's see, you know, mathematically it's going to be very easy. So k star f at x, by definition, this is equal to the expectation of f 1 minus lambda z plus lambda x. So we see that this is upper bounded by 1 minus lambda, the expectation of f of z, plus lambda f of x. So it's almost what we wanted, except that instead of the integral of f against kp, I find the integral of f against z, this random variable z. So the next idea is let's take z to be equal to kp. But now it becomes self-referential. I define k in function of z, and now I define z in function of k. Okay, so. So for those of you who have experimented with those things, you know, it smells like there is some fractal coming up. And, uh, and indeed, there is. So, so let's see that. And we will avoid it. Okay? We, won't, we won't have to deal with the fractal. Uh, I will still tell you a little bit about it, but uh, we won't have to deal with it. Okay, so the next idea is you know, this variable z, which is doing the exploration for me, it was, uh, I get to define it. So set z such that uh, z is equal to kp in distribution. What does it mean? It means that it's equal to 1 minus lambda z plus lambda x, where x is sampled from p. Right? This is a definition of kp. kp is, you know, I apply k to p, so it's, I replace this little x by a sample from p. Okay, and those two things are independent. So I want z to be equal in distribution to 1 minus lambda z x. So geometrically, what does it mean? The picture is like this. So we, we say maybe the, the name, I find it suggestive. It's the core, we define it, we say that z is the core of p. Why is it the core? You see, imagine that P was uniform over this, this set. Okay, so this X, let's say it's a capital X, it's a random point from the body. Now, what do I want? I want, so let's say this is a distribution of Z. Okay, I'm just, it's, it's some picture, okay? It's not really the distribution, but okay, it's mostly concentrated here. What I want is when I take a random point from X and I take a random point from Z, and now I put myself at the, at the point on the segment 1 minus lambda z plus lambda x, I want this point to still be distributed as z. 
So it's really extracting some kind of, you know, the core of my convex body. So we don't know, we, we don't know much about those, those objects. In fact, we don't know anything. For instance, a, a fun question uh, from a convex geometry perspective is what is the core of, you know, typical convex body? Let's say I don't even know what is the core of a Euclidean ball. Okay, so. But, you know, it's extracting something at the center of the body. And why is it good for us? So again, let me just uh, maybe take a step back. If you define Z to be the core of P, so now P is not a convex body. P is this uh, distribution which comes from the exponential weight. I extract the core of P, and now I define my kernel to be this kind of exploration kernel. So my kernel is, you know, it takes a, the way it makes a particle evolve, is that it takes its particle, it takes a random point from this exploration distribution Z, and it puts itself on the segment. Okay? So this is how it acts on the measure. Now, if I play, so I have my exponential weight. I play now from this Kp. Okay, so Kp is, you take P and you do some extra exploration, if you wish. Um, then I define my L till T, which is my unbiased estimator of K star LT. And if I do this, then I get that my regret, you know, in the real world is controlled by my regret in the virtual world, which is what I can hope to control up to the variance term, which is what we will what's left to do, and up to this term of 1 over lambda. So that's where we are at right now. Um, but let's talk a little bit about this guy, okay, the core. So maybe a first observation is that it's not always bad. Okay? For instance, uh, if uh, x was Gaussian, then the core would just be another Gaussian. Okay, maybe a formula for this is, is like this. Z, it's always equal to, the, to lambda times the infinite sum for k equals 0 to infinity of 1 minus lambda to the k, xk, where the xk is just an IID sequence from p. So xk is IID from p. Okay, why is that? Just why is that? If I multiply this guy by 1 minus lambda, I'm just shifting the index of summation from 0 to 1. And when I add lambda x, I add back the 0 term. Okay, so indeed, this z verifies that z in distribution is 1 minus lambda z plus lambda x. Okay, and in fact, this is a unique solution. So the core is really this thing. And you see that if, z, if x was Gaussian, then, you know, uh, um, the Gaussians are closed by summation of the random variable. So, you know, if, if I have x plus y and x and y are independent Gaussians, then x plus y is a Gaussian. So this sum is going to be a Gaussian. Okay, yes? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is a lambda core. Uh-huh. Very good. So this is the key point, is how, how does it behave when lambda moves? So this is what we have to work with. So now the question, you know, is really to control the variance, we will have to talk about the smoothness of this core. And you see, okay, when I look at this equation, what I want to say is that if I take lambda small enough, okay, I, I know some people don't like what I'm going to say, but when you take lambda small enough, what you're doing is that you're pushing your decision more towards infinity. You're waiting longer to make a decision of what is z. Okay, and typically, if you delay, the, the more you delay your decision, the smoother the end result. Okay, so you expect, or at least I expect when I look at this, that if you take a smaller value of lambda, you're going to get something smoother. Okay, and uh, we'll see that this is not true exactly, but essentially true. Okay, and of course, the smaller lambda, the bigger this discrepancy between the real world and the virtual world. Okay. Now let's talk a little bit, just, uh, just as an aside, let's talk about those fractals that come up. So just an uh, aside. So we, we are the first one to define this, but uh, there is a closely related object, which is called the Bernoulli convolution, when x is a Rademacher. Okay, so it's just a random sign. So for x is a Rademacher, which means plus 1 with priority a half, minus 1 with priority a half. The lambda core 
is a Bernoulli convolution. Okay, so this was introduced in the uh, 1930s, and it's one of uh, Erdos' uh, favorite objects. And there are still a lot of open questions about those guys. So let's try to understand what this is. So let's, let's try to understand it in terms of this infinite summation. OK, so think, let's think, so this is 0. Let's, let's just think what happens when lambda is 2 third. OK, so when lambda is 2 third, my first decision is I go either 1 third to the left or 1 third to the right. Okay, so either I go here to minus 1 third, or I go here to plus 1 third. Okay, and I keep doing that. Then I go, uh, you know, here, and then here, and then here. So you see, at the end, this measure, the, the, the two-third core of a random sign, is supported on a Cantor set. Okay, so the two-third core of a random sign is supported on a Cantor set. So in this, in this context, maybe a, a good, you know, a rough notion of smoothness would just be, is it absolutely continuous with respect to the Lebesgue measure or not? OK, something absolutely continuous with respect to the Lebesgue measure, at least it's nice, it's a little bit nice. This is not nice. OK, but you can see what is the one half core. Do you guys see what is the one half core? Yeah, so, so it's, it's just uniform in the interval. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's just I, with 41 half, I move there, with 40 half here, you know. I'm just describing a ran, you know, the random uh, uh, binary extension of a number between 0 and 1, or between minus a half and, and a half, or minus 1 and 1, whatever it is. Okay, so the 1 half core is uniform on some interval. Okay, so we see that the lambda core, so this being supported on a Cantor set, this was true for any lambda strictly larger than a half. But now we see that a half suddenly it becomes very nice. And if you follow what I was saying before, you know, you would maybe expect that as lambda gets smaller, okay, it just becomes more and more smooth. But then comes uh, Erdos. So Erdos in uh, 1939. It proved that there exists an infinity of singular. So what, what I mean by singular lambda is a, a value of lambda where, uh, where the lambda core is singular with respect to the Lebesgue measure. So there exists an infinity of singular lambda in the interval 0, 1 half. OK, so in fact, there are many, many values of lambda where you know, it, becomes, it, it became nice, and then it's becoming ugly again. It's not difficult actually to prove. Uh, I mean, assuming some, some, some stuff in number theory. So the way you can do it is just, uh, you can just do the Fourier transform of this thing. And then you will see that it becomes singular when there are some nasty cancellations. And those nasty cancellations, they translate into some algebraic formula for lambda. And those algebraic for, formula for lambda, they have a name. You know, the lambdas that verify those formulas, they are called piezo number. So really, the, the, the crux of this proof is to prove that there is an infinity of piezo number, blah, 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 in some interval. So this is what, what he proved. Um, but now, uh, OK, so this is bad news for us. We don't like that. But now here is something more recent. Uh, I think it's Erdos proved it partially in uh, 46. And the real proof is from Solomiak 96 is that almost every lambda in 0, 1 half is absolutely continuous. So yes, there are counterexamples, but they are very, very specific. They need to verify those you know, number theoretic uh, uh, properties. And most lambdas just do not verify it. Now, more interesting for us, in fact, and I think this goes back to way back, 
for any integer k in n, there exists a lambda k, which is something like roughly 1 over k, such that uh, the lambda k core is ck. Okay, so the density, it doesn't only have a density, but the density is also k times differentiable, which is exactly where we want to go with our business. Okay, with our business, we will want, because the variance will depend on the smoothness, we want more and more smoothness, so we will want a small lambda. And this is indicating that, indeed, we can hope for something like this. Um, let's see. If you want to think about this, I don't necessarily recommend it, but a nice open problem is to show that there exists an interval 0a such that every lambda in 0a is absolutely continuous. Okay, so in fact, those counterexamples, they stop at some point. Uh, okay, you get a big reward if you do that. Um, okay, but this is just really an aside. Uh, this is not, uh, we won't have to deal with this. Uh, for starters, we start with something absolutely continuous with respect to the Lebesgue measure. But do you think that the answer is yes for this open question? Say again? Do you think that the answer is yes? Yes, yes. I mean, it's not me. It's this community who thinks yes. They think that the yes. Is yes. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, they think that those counterexamples, they stop at some point. Uh, Why? Do you know? <laughs> well, it's related to those piezo number, and they just think that there are, you know, no piezo number close to zero. I mean, then we would need to write what is a piezo number and, you know, uh, yeah. Okay, so any other question on this? Yeah, this is a really nice topic. I mean, it's, it's, it's really luck that we got onto this. Uh, so Yuval Perez, who is, who is my, you know, next door colleague, is, is the expert on those stuff, uh, on this stuff. So it's really just pure luck that uh, we got onto this and he knew about that. Um, but it won't be useful at all, unfortunately. <laughs> I wish it was, but sadly it's a, okay, it's recorded, so I won't say anything. Uh, <laughs> okay, maybe I will say it. It's what, you know, it's, <laughs> It's one of those examples where they develop a whole set of tools which are very, very deep, but somehow they only work for this very special case of a random sign. So as soon as you change a little bit the distribution, as far as we can tell, the tools are not working anymore. So, you know, there is a huge literature on those things, and, you know, if you get the result, you publish it in, in Annals of Mass automatically, but, uh, but those tools are so specific, they don't say anything about the situation that we care about. So it's a bit unfortunate. Okay, let's see what I want to do next. Oh yeah, so now we need to talk about the, the variance. Uh, yeah. Okay, so let's do a heuristic calculation for the variance. Uh, I don't know what number it is. Heuristic calculation for the variance. So right now, we don't have any constraint on, on lambda so far. I mean, we just know that the smaller lambda, the bigger the gap between the real world and the virtual world. But of course, the, the, the condition that lambda has to be small will come from the variance calculation. So what do we care about? We care about the expectation of pt integrated against l t squared. OK, well, remember that l t is uh, equal to uh, at y. Uh, any point? It's Lt of xt, kt of xt dot, over uh, KQ, kt uh, pt of xt. Okay, this is, this is L tilde. Okay, and what is kt pt? kt pt of xt dot, uh, this is nothing but the integral of k of xt, y, pty, dy. 
Okay, and I want to upper bound this thing. Very good. So if I want to upper bound this thing, you see I will integrate this against point in, in, in PT. So what I need is I will plug in a Y which is from the support of PT. So what, what would be enough? So it's enough. Let's simplify this as much as possible. Enough so that for all Y and Y prime in the support of PT. Okay, so what is Y prime? Y prime is going to be this denominator. I want to control KT of XT Y over KT of XT Y prime. This is what I want to control. Okay, if I can upper bound this, then I will have an upper bound just in, in function value on L tilde for any point Y which is in the support for, of PT. So this is what I want to, to bound. And XT is sample from, from, from KTPT, so maybe it's enough to not upper bound this for all XT, but only with high probability with respect to XT. So let's say it's enough to, uh, to control, so for all Y and Y prime in the support of PT, this is going to be smaller than something, and this I want it with high probability, say larger than uh, 1 minus 1 over T to the 10, with high probability with respect to X sampled from KTPT. Okay, let me erase that. So this is what I want to control. And let me erase all the index on, on time. You know, time is there. That, that's okay. So that's what we want. We have this kernel, which is constructed as a function of P using this core. And what we want to say is that for any two points in the support, K, you see, what is this? This is log Lipschitzness. You see, what I want to say is that when I take the log of this, log of K x dot is Lipschitz. Okay, so let's do the calculation. So let's say... Uh, in other words, we want log k of x dot to be Lipschitz. To be Lipschitz on the support of Okay, and what, what do I mean exactly? So what I mean exactly is that if log of kx dot is Lipschitz, so say log of kx dot is uh, O1 Lipschitz with respect to some norm, let's say with respect to some dual norm, and uh, the size of the support of P in, in this norm is bounded by some radius R, then, then we will get that the expectation of PT L tilde T squared, this is going to be bounded by just uh, R. So that's, that's what we want to say. Log, log, do I want e to the r? Mm. Okay, so that's, okay, I'm not sure about what I just wrote right now. Uh, I, feel, I feel like it should be exponential of R, but uh, log kx dot is Lipschitz. Um, so I will take the log of this, 
and I want to say this is smaller than, you know, if I take any point, yeah, it would be exponential of r. I don't know what I'm saying. So let's say if this was L, I think you get e to the r L. Yeah, that makes sense? If I take the log in this inequality, log of the ratio, I get log of the difference. The second, uh, yeah, okay, that, that's correct. So we want log of k uh, to be Lipschitz. So now, what is k in, in terms of c, in terms of the core? So let me write the formula. So remember that k at delta x, okay, this is, let's say, at, at, a, at a point y. What is this? This is 1 minus lambda z plus lambda x, and this at the point y. Okay, so I hope these notations are clear. Again, I'm confusing everything. Densities, random variable, measures, all of this. Okay, so when I apply k to a point mass at x, what I get is this is k of x, y, this density. And what is k delta x? It's, a, it's a, this random variable, 1 minus lambda z plus lambda x, and I want to know the density of this at y. Okay, let's say if this is, if this is z, uh, then this is what? This is z at, uh, let's see, it's z at 1 minus lambda and y minus lambda x. But why do I get this? Uh, what is going on? <laughs> ah, oh, sorry. Sorry, guys. I missed. This is, okay. K of x, y, it's k applied to delta y at the point x. Sorry. I, my bad. This is x, and so this is x minus lambda y. Okay, that looks better. Okay, very good. So now we see something that we like. Okay, finally. We see something that we like because you see, what we want is this thing to be Lipschitz with respect to y. But you see, when I take lambda to zero, this is going to be more and more Lipschitz. Okay, so what we really want is, the question is what is log? So what we want is log of z x minus lambda y over 1 minus lambda, we want this to be Lipschitz with respect to y. Okay, so that's what we want. We want the log of, of z. Uh, okay, which is roughly like the log of the kernel at x minus lambda y. Okay, good. So now this looks like a formula maybe we can work with. We want the log of the core at a point x minus lambda y, where x is a typical point from kp. We want this to be Lipschitz on the support of p. Now at this point, I don't know how to continue the calculation. Okay, so now we will need to, to do a leap of faith, and I'm going to make some heuristics. Okay, this, I started by saying heuristics. So far, it's not heuristics, it's, it's formal. So what do we want? I'm going to assume, I'm going to make two assumptions. So heuristic assumption. And I'm going to think a little bit like a physicist. So let's see. So my first assumption is going to be that P is Gaussian. Okay, so, okay. I mean, P, maybe eventually we can hope it's going to be something like a log concave uh, measure, but... Uh, uh, why, why do I say that? I say that because remember that, uh, let's see, what do we want? P is exponential minus eta, the sum of those L tilde. Right. And these L tilde, we want them to approximate K star L. K star L is a convex function, so we hope by concentration that this is close to a convex function. If this is close to a convex function, then P is close to a log concave. So we will need to say that it's not exactly log concave, but close to a log concave. In this business of uh, high dimensional convex geometry, people like to say that log concave are close to Gaussian in some sense. 
still this we will work to, to, to make this formal and this I will do it with you. Okay, so this one we will be able to remove, this assumption. But why is it very nice? It's, it's an exercise to see that then the core is a Gaussian centered but with variance lambda over 2 minus lambda. Okay, so you see you had this nice Gaussian and then the lambda core is just a smaller Gaussian inside it. Okay, this is just a small calculation. You do this infinite uh, summation. So in particular, we will be able to calculate this guy. <coughs> now the second assumption is where I'm being a real physicist. So I assume, I'm going to assume both at the same time. I, I'm assuming that it's a Gaussian and that it has a compact support. Okay, so, uh, so the support of P is, uh, let's going to assume that it's included in a ball. It's included in, let's say, all the point X, such that the Euclidean norm is smaller than some value R. Okay, I will, I will need this. Okay, this second assumption we won't, I will tell you some general things about how to remove it, but almost all of the paper is about removing this second assumption. Okay, sadly. But I will explain why this is such a big difficulty. And we won't be crazy, you know, we're going to take R to be something like O tilde of square root 10, or even as big as you want. Okay, so, you know, a ball of radius square root 10, it contains most of the mass of a Gaussian. Okay, so, Really, most of the mass is contained in this, but there is a little bit of mass outside, which actually makes it very tricky. Okay, we'll see that. But let's see how to conclude the calculation using those two assumptions. So, of course, now the norm that I'm going to put on my space, because I, I made everything isotropic, is just going to be the Euclidean norm. If things were not isotropic, I would just put the norm which comes from the covariance of P. But we, we're going to ignore this and just do this calculation. Okay, so let's do the calculation. So we want uh, log of z. And we want to say that this is Lipschitz, so we want to calculate the gradient of this. So what is the gradient with respect to y of log of x minus of z of x minus lambda y? Well, what is log of z? Okay, maybe what is log of z of x minus lambda y? So z is just a Gaussian. So z of, uh, I don't know, h. This is proportional to e to the minus norm of h uh, squared over 2. And of course, it's not 2, but it's uh, 2 lambda times 2 minus lambda. OK, so I'm going to forget about the 2 minus lambda and the 2. It doesn't matter. It's only the 1 over lambda that matters. OK, this is the density of the core, because I assume that it's a Gaussian. And now the core is a Gaussian with variance lambda. So log of this up to the minus sign, okay, minus log of this, this is nothing but 1 over lambda, the norm of x minus lambda y squared. Okay, the Euclidean norm. Okay, so now I can do the calculation. So what is the gradient of this? The gradient with respect to y of log of z x minus lambda y. Okay, so I get uh, the lambdas, they cancel each other. And what do I find? I find x minus lambda y. Mm. Yes. So I care about the norm of this. Okay, the Euclidean norm of this. The Euclidean norm of this. So this is upper bounded by the Euclidean norm of x plus lambda times the Euclidean norm of y. Now you see why the support of p being bounded matters. I know that y is in the support of p, so the Euclidean norm of y is smaller than r. So this is smaller than lambda r. Now what about this guy? This guy, I uh, was smart enough to tell you that you don't want it for all x, but you want it with high probability with respect to x. So what is x? x is from kp, which means it's of the form 1 minus lambda z plus lambda x, or lambda y, where y is from p. 
So we know, you know, what is Z? Z is a Gaussian with variance lambda. So with high probability, this is going to be smaller than square root, the norm of this. So the norm of Z is smaller with high probability than something like O tilde square root lambda n. Okay, again, I told you that uh, uh, standard Gaussian, most of the mass is in a ball of radius square root n. But now it's a Gaussian of variance lambda, so most of the mass in a ball of, of radius square root lambda n. And the norm of lambda y, this is smaller than lambda r. So what we get is that with high probability, this is smaller than uh, square root lambda n plus lambda r. Okay, maybe with a 2. So you see that as you take lambda smaller, this is going to be tiny. So the smaller you take lambda, the more, the more smooth is the kernel. But we had, we had to pay a big price to make this conclusion, which was to assume that the exponential weight gives you something Gaussian and to assume that the support was bounded. And let's see what we get exactly out of this. So now we see, okay, lambda r, r is like square root n. So you see that out of this, you get that it's constant Lipschitz provided by that lambda is like 1 over n squared. Okay, so, so the suggestion, the prediction of this, so this suggests, suggests, that lambda, which is smaller than something like 1 over n squared, uh, gives uh, smoothness. And in fact, <clears throat> In fact, it's a bit more complicated than this because what we want is r times l. So we want r times l to be bounded. So r times l, you know, I need, so what I want, okay, sorry, so this was with high priority. So we want, so r times l, this is bounded by uh, n square root lambda plus lambda n. So really what this suggests is lambda to be, uh, Ah, no, this is what I said. Okay, 1 over n squared. Okay, good, good. This suggests this. You see, one, when you have this, so remember, that's what I was saying here. If log k is L Lipschitz and the size of the support is r, then you get that the variance is like exponential r l. So you want r times l to be a constant. r is like square root n. So, and this is l. So r times l is like n square root lambda plus lambda n. So if you take lambda to be much smaller than 1 over n squared, then you get that r times l is a constant. So what I'm saying is that if you take the, the lambda, the lambda core, if you take lambda that small, then in fact the variance is a constant, the variance in the virtual world. So what does it give you? So you get, you get this. You get real regret is bounded by 1 over lambda virtual regret. And the virtual regret is bounded by two things. You get, uh, you get the size of the set over eta plus eta t times the variance. Now, I want, so we just said that this is O1, the variance. And the size of the set, I won't do it, but it's just some entropy calculation. But basically, you're in dimension n, so this is going to be bounded by n. Okay, so what you get when you optimize, you get that this is bounded by 1 over lambda square root nt. And lambda, I just said that we can take it as small as 1 over n squared. So this would be n to the 2.5 square root t. So right now, making a lot of assumptions that we're not able to verify, we would get a regret in n to the 2.5 square root t. 
Now you can improve a little bit. Uh, um, instead of bounding this almost surely with respect to y, you can try to bound you know, the integral with respect to y. And if you bound the integral with respect to y, then you get a better prediction. Uh, so in fact, conjecture is that lambda smaller than 1 over n is enough at this point. It's enough to give you smoothness. So even that I'm not able to, uh, or maybe I'm able to show that. OK, no, this, okay, this I'm able to show, that uh, if you have lambda that small, then OK, you don't control the re the, this variance almost surely. I mean, you don't control the magnitude, but you control the variance. So if you get 1 over n, then this would predict n to the 1.5 square root t, okay, which is the conjecture that I made at the beginning of the, of the lecture, that I think this is the right answer for this problem. But we're very far from it right now. Um. OK, so let me now uh, conclude by telling you how to remove the Gaussian assumption. I, I want to tell you this because I think it's reasonably canonical what we did. And then for this one, I will just say some, some, some words about it. But I don't think it's canonical. And I think there is a lot of things you can do to, to remove this uh, bound more nicely. OK? And, and just to, to tell you what's going to happen. So removing this will lead us to a regret in n to the 4.5 square t. And removing this will finally lead us to this n to the 9.5 square t. But what I conjecture is that this step, you don't need to do what we do if the, if the sequence of LTs is IID. So I, I opened the whole uh, course by saying that we want to move away from IID. But still, there are problems where IID makes sense. And you know we might want to, to have a tight answer for the IID case. And for the IID case, this would be the state of the art by far. Um, and, but I don't know how to prove it. So in the IID case, you will see the, what, basically what I want to say is that in the IID case, there is some part, some mechanism in the algorithm that never gets triggered. OK, so I will make this more precise. Yes, please. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so this is a really excellent question. So, yes, our first proof was taking lambda to be random. So, so this is indeed you can do that, but then I find it even more mysterious if you do that because then you push everything into this distribution over lambda, uh, and you, yeah, may, maybe this is a better idea. I don't know. So I'm going to do something else right now. What I'm going to do is that I'm going to show to you that in any log concave, there is inside any log concave, there is a Gaussian. And then instead of taking the core of the log concave, you can take the core of the Gaussian which sits inside the log concave. And then that will let you get away from this. But yes, another way would be to just randomize over lambda. Uh, and this leads you to totally different calculations, which uh, Yinta did, uh, but it's a bit impenetrable for me. Uh, so, yeah. But, but yes, may, maybe it's better. I don't know. Any, any other question? <clears throat> yeah, this is a good, uh, a, a good avenue of uh, research. This one. OK, so now let's do the reduction to the Gaussian case. Reduction to the Gaussian case. So let me introduce some terminology. I will say that the measure mu is convexly dominated by a measure mu. Okay, so a measure is convexly dominated by another measure. If whenever I test this measure against a convex function, the answer I get is smaller than when I test against nu. Okay, so this, by definition, means that the integral of nu against f is smaller than the integral of nu against f for any f, for any f convex. OK, what does this mean? Uh, maybe uh, for the probabilist, a simpler way to think about this 
is saying that basically if I have x which is sampled from mu and y which is sampled from mu, there is a coupling where in fact y is equal to x plus uh, uh, a martingale. And what I mean by martingale is a random variable whose expectation conditionally on x is 0. Okay, so a measure mu is dominated by nu if nu is basically mu plus a little bit of noise. Okay, which makes a lot of sense then that you know, against any convex function you get a, something larger. Okay, this is just a definition, makes sense. So now the key observation is that we didn't really need z to be the core of p, but it was enough that z would convexly dominate the core of p. So remember, recall, that what we had when we said that uh, k delta x was equal to 1 minus lambda z plus lambda x, then we would say that k star f of x is, equal, is bounded by 1 minus lambda, the expectation of z, plus lambda uh, f of x. And the question we had was we wanted this to be smaller than 1 minus lambda kp applied to f plus lambda f of x. So we said, OK, let's just take z to be equal to kp. But in fact, it's enough that z is convexly dominated by p. So for this, enough that z is convexly dominated by p, uh, kp, sorry. And in fact, this is verified if uh, z is the core of some r, which is itself convexly dominated by p. Okay, what I want to avoid is really I want to avoid talking about the core of P. This is something I don't understand. We don't understand. What is the core of P? We don't want to talk about this. What we're willing to talk about is the core of something which is convexly dominated by P because this something we will be able to take it as a Gaussian. Okay, so that's what we're doing. So now here is the, the key geometric lemma. So the lemma is that let P be an isotropic. So isotropic just means that the mean is zero and the covariance is the identity. So let P be an isotropic log concave measure. Then If I take a Gaussian centered at the origin and of variance something which is like O tilde of 1 over n times the identity, this is approximately convexly dominated uh, by P. Okay, I'm going to make this a little bit more precise. But it's not exactly convexly dominated, but it's approximately convexly dominated. You see, it, it cannot be exactly convexly dominated by P because the Gaussian has some mass you know, far away, and maybe P is compactly supported. Okay, so it cannot be this to be true. But again, it's the same issue as this, you know, the fact that the Gaussians are not compactly supported is very annoying to us. Uh, I wish it wasn't like this. Okay. Good. So let's do the proof of this. So I'm going to prove something uh, a little bit different. I will prove that inside any P there is a small ball and that any measure on this small ball is convexly dominated by P. So in fact, 
we prove that any measure, let's call it Q, supported on the ball, let's say, all the point X, such that the norm of X is smaller than, let's say, 1 over 80, some number, okay, a small ball. Uh, in fact, we prove that any measure Q supported on the ball is convexly dominated by P. Okay, so this is what we will prove. Now, a Gaussian, you know, with that small variance, all of its mass you know, is on a small ball like this. There is a little bit of mass outside, and this is why we have this approx approximately instead of uh, exactly. But apart from that, that's what we get. Very good. So now what do we want to do? We want to do the following. So the way I want to think about it is like this. I have this small ball, okay? And really I have this other measure. So P is isotropic. So really most of the mass is outside of this small ball. Now let's take, let's pick a, a, a test function. So pick F uh, test function. So it's a convex function, okay? It's convex. Clearly, notice that this type of inequality, you know, I can add uh, any linear function. It's not going to change anything to the answer, okay? Um, because the mean is zero, okay? So these are centered distribution. So if I add a linear function, you know, it's still, it's just add a zero term. So without loss of generality, I can assume that f of zero is zero and f is non-negative. Okay, I can just add a linear function to make the minimum to be zero and I can add some constant to make it non-negative. Now I can also multiply by a constant to make that the maximum is one. Okay, and the maximum of f, let's say on this ball b, is one. Okay, are we clear on this reduction? So again, this, so what I said is that if you have a convex function f, if you add a linear function, then the integral of the linear function against a centered mu, this is zero, okay, just because the expectation of x is zero. Adding a constant, it adds the constant to both sides of the inequality. Multiplying by a constant, it just multiplies both sides of the inequality. So I can add linear functions, I can add affine function and multiply by a constant. By adding an affine function, I can make sure that the minimum is at zero and that its value is zero. And by multiplying, I can make sure that uh, the maximum on this ball is one. Okay, so I have this convex function. It's zero here. This is the minimum. And there is some point here, probably, where the value is one. Now, I know that this is a convex function, so it's above a linear function. Okay? In fact, it's above the maximum between zero and a linear function. So really, think of it like this. I have I have some grid, you know, maybe, uh, okay, I'm drawing it like this. Yeah, I guess I'm drawing it like this. Maybe let me add some twist uh, like this. So I have some gradient, okay? I don't know how to draw those things, sorry. So here it's going up. <coughs> okay, so it's, it's flat like this. It's flat, and then it's going up. So I know because it's a convex function that it's above this flat function here and going up. Okay, why flat? Because I said that zero is the minimum. Now what I want to say is that when I will integrate this lower bound, you know, I know that when I integrate Q against F, I will get at most one. Okay, so the integral <coughs> of Q against F is at most one. Because Q is supported on this thing, it can only see function values of at most one. Now what I want to say is that the integral of P against F this is going to be bigger than one. That's what I want to say. Okay, so this is the question. And why is this true? Well, to, to say that I will see large values of f with p, it's enough to say that I will see large values for this lower bound. 
Okay, so you know if you know, if you like uh, deep networks, this is a ReLU. Okay, this is a rectified linear unit. Okay, just doesn't matter. But so this is bigger. This integral is bigger than p against this. Uh, let's call it L plus function. Okay, this maximum between a linear function and zero. Now what I want to say is that I want to use the fact that it's isotropic. Okay, so it's isotropic. So the second moment is large. But now it turns out that for, uh, for log concave measure, the second moment and the first moment are of the same order. Okay, so the expectation of, uh, so if x is real and log concave, then the expectation of the absolute value of x is larger by up to some constant than the expectation of x squared. You see, this is a reverse Jensen. Okay. The way to think about it is that the second moment is small. Okay. Usually, this means, this exactly means that it has light tails, that there is not too much mass on large values. Okay. So this is a small lemma to be proved that we won't do. But now that you know that this is, in our case, it's isotropic, so this is 1. Okay. If I look at in the direction of the gradient, when I project, in any direction I get a variance of 1. That's what it means to be isotropic. So in particular, in this direction of the, of the gradient, I know that I get a variance of 1. Okay? But if I get a variance of 1, you know, most of the time, I mean, many times I'm going to hit some values which are large on this linear function. Okay? So I see that, uh, that this value is going to be at least some constant. And because I made this ball you know, very tiny of size 1 over 80, and it went up to value 1, in space 1 over 80, then the gradient is very large. Okay, the derivative is very large, so this, the slope is very high. So if I get to, a, to you know, distance a half or, or two thirds, then I see very large values. Okay, I try to make it as intuitive as possible. The, the calculation is just uh, trivial, the, the formal calculation. Uh, but this is how you come up with it. Um, did this make sense? Is there a question on this? So again, the key point, the key point of log concave that we are exploiting are these light tails, meaning that the second moment is controlled by the first moment. Okay, now of course, the real proof, it has to work much harder because uh, we don't have exactly log concave measure. We have only approximately log concave measure. Uh, and, and you need, you know, to prove that it's approximately log concave, you need to use a concentration inequality, which itself, you know, uh, uh, rest on the fact that this lemma is true for the previous time step, so there is a little induction argument, but all of this can be done. So now let me make just a few comments about the, the, the finite support and then conclude. Okay. So finite support. Okay, so the picture is like this. This is a convex body on which we're playing. And right now we played for a long time and we start to, to understand that maybe the optimum is here. Okay? And that's the scale at which we believe the, we, we have some uncertainty. So we don't know exactly where the optimum is. Now I said that the support, before my assumption was that the support of P was uh, where, where essentially where almost all mass where almost all mass is. So let's say almost all the mass is in this ball right now. So what I want to do to apply what I did before is to actually just truncate. Okay, so I can just truncate and say I'm just never going to visit those places anymore. But this is really, really bad in our adversarial setting. Because the adversary could make me focus on this region and then completely shift. You know, then completely move the next convex function. And now the next convex function, they will have a large value here and the minimum will be there. Okay, so you cannot afford to do that. Now the trick is, is going to be the following. The trick is going to be that if you start to detect that indeed the adversary is playing with you like this, then you will want to restart the algorithm. You will say, okay, 
you made me focus there, but now you're moving the minimum there. Let me just completely restart from the beginning. And what we want to prove is that at the time of restart, you have actually negative regret. So I don't remember if I said that at the very beginning of the course, but you know, when you look at regret, you could actually have negative regret. I mean, you're changing all the time, and the ad, you know, opt, you're fixing opt to a single point. So opt could, you know, do much worse than you. So you could have negative regret. This is exactly a situation where you expect to have negative regret. Because to focus on this region, it must have been that those points, they were behaving very pretty badly, right? They, were, they, they had the function value which was pretty much larger than some other point here. So by convexity, if those points are bad, we expect everybody outside to be bad. So in particular, this point that the adversary wants to make good right now, during the time that it was making me focus here, this guy was paying a lot. So if I catch the adversary as it's moving over there, the optimum over there, if I catch it early enough, then I can hope to have negative regret with respect to this point. So the key, so there are two keys. So, so restart if, uh, if it's fishy. But do it quickly enough. to get negative regret. Okay. So how, so let's think just technically for a minute, how in the bound are you, get, are you gonna get negative regret? Well, there is one thing we never really used, which was, I always dropped it, which was this Bregman divergence between y and x1, you know, over eta. What it really was, was the Bregman divergence between y and x1 minus the Bregman divergence between y and xt. And I always drop this term because the intuition was that hopefully, by the end of the process, xt is close to y. Okay, so this term should be some small thing that we discard. But now we are exactly in a situation where we believe y to be this guy far away. And right now we're focused here, xt. So if we catch it just at the right time, you know, this is gonna be, this is gonna be much bigger than this. This was at the beginning of time, where it was uniform, but now if you just stop at the time where right now I'm focused here, the Bregman, you know, between this and that is gonna be much bigger. So we can hope to get negative regret from, from this. The problem is, there is a telescopic sum. So indeed, if we stop perfectly at the right time, we're good. But if we continue a little bit further, then there is, you know, those terms are gonna telescope and we won't get the negative regret. So the next idea, and there will only be two, two ideas left. So the next idea is to inc introduce an increasing learning rate. So to catch quickly enough, what you can do is to do an increasing learning rate. So you know in machine learning and in, uh, in optimization, when you do gradient descent, usually you reduce the step size as you go. You know, you want to make smaller and smaller step. Here you will do the other, the other way around. You will do bigger and bigger step. Why do you want to do that? Because the bigger learning rate means that you move faster. So you react more quickly to the adversary. So when the adversary, you know, I said that you, you want to, to see this quickly. So a bigger learning rate will exactly make you realize this more quickly. Mathematically, how is it gonna translate? this change of learning rate is gonna uh, cancel uh, the, the telescopic sum. So all the terms will be there with some small constant. Now the last idea is that you cannot afford to increase the learning rate all the time. Okay, because if you increase the learning rate all the time, at the end you have a huge learning rate and it's bad. So you can only do this very sparsely. So the next idea is when do you increase the learning rate? And this, we do it like this. So imagine right now I'm focused like this. And you know, I, I stay on this region until I get to a smaller region, which is of a different scale. So once the covariance matrix of my PT has changed scale, it's like a half smaller, then I say, okay, the scale of the problem has changed, so let me drop all of this and increase my learning rate. So I don't increase my learning rate every time, I only increase it when the scale of the problem is changing. And because the scale of the problem cannot change too many times, you know, it can only change like n log t, this will be fine uh, uh, for this increasing learning rate. 
Yes, and that's, that's what you do to uh, finish the algorithm. But my point is, coming back to the IID case of the IID losses, IID losses will not do that. They will not make you focus on some region only to move away later on. So for IID losses, I believe that the restart condition is just never triggered. What is the restart condition? By the way, the restart condition is just if at some point uh, the optimum on this region gets close to the boundary. Then you say, okay, this is not normal. The optimum in that region should be towards the center, not towards the boundary. So if the optimum in that region gets close to the boundary, then you say, okay, let me restart. Yes, please go. From scratch. Completely from scratch. And you made progress because if you have negative regret, you're just at a ha you know, larger time and, uh, and you didn't pay anything. If you focus on what? On the true point, yeah? Yes. I mean, how can you know if you focus on the true point? Yeah, yeah, we are, we, you increase the learning rate always. And you know, this, this is where you lose uh, n to the 5 in this business because there are many things uh, going on. Okay, then let me, if there is no more question on this, let me conclude with a few you know, topics to go further uh, on this. Say chapter five uh, topics to go further. So one uh, very important uh, model for bandits that we didn't talk about, which is the main one for application, is contextual bandits. This is what people actually use in practice. So now what happens is that you have X, which is a context space. Let's keep it abstract for the moment. And you have pi, which is a policy space. So it's a set of, of, uh, of uh, it's included in the set of mapping from X to, let's say, actions. Okay. And now the game goes like this. At every T, Um, what do you do? At every t, you observe xt, then choose, uh, choose it in one to n. So it's exa uh, and suffer lt of it. Okay, so this is like the multi arm bandit problem. Except that now at every time step, you get to see a context. What is the big difference? Why is there this policy space? It's because you benchmark now. It's not the best action in hindsight, but it's the best mapping from context to actions. So the regret now, the contextual regret, this is going to be the sum of LT of IT minus the minimum of a pi in your policy space of the sum of uh, LT of pi of XT. Okay, this is a contextual rigor. So this comes back to some of the questions that were at the very beginning about, you know, the benchmark being weak. Here you have a very strong benchmark. Okay. So again, imagine, you know, if I want to predict uh, if I want to select ads on my website and I have the users coming, I have some information about the user. And maybe I want to compare myself to the best decision tree. I have some you know, set of decision tree I, that I could use to select the, the ad, and I just want to online select the best decision tree. So how can you do that? Well, there is an algorithm called EXP4, which is just multiplicative weights on pi. Okay, so you can just assign a weight to every policy. And now, 
Again, it's bended, so you need to have an unbiased estimator for the loss of every policy. But it's easy. You can now we have done it enough that you can expect the variance of the natural unbiased estimator to be n instead of the size of the policy space. Plus, let's say natural estimator. You can guess it by now, I think. And the theorem that we will prove. So this is in this famous paper by our Cesar Bianchi, uh, Freund, and Chapiri in 95 is that the regret that you will get is square root tn log of the size of pi. Okay, so this is uh, very nice, really beautiful. Um, the problem is that it's not very practical. It's not very practical because you need a weight for every policy in your policy space. Maybe the policy space is huge. Okay, so I won't state any theorem, but there is a recent effort I will call it an effort because I don't think they have the final answer on the oracle model. And I will just say what it is rather than writing it. So the names to check are Agarval, uh, Langford, Shapiri. So this is in uh, MSR New York. The Oracle model goes like this. Maybe I don't even know what is my policy space. It's a huge space. But what I can do, let me assume that I can solve this problem. Meaning if you give me a sequence of losses and a sequence of contacts, then I can tell you what was the best policy. Okay, this seems to make sense that you know, if you cannot even do this problem, then of course you're not going to be able to do the bandit problem. So it sort of sidesteps the computational complexity and it puts it in the offline problem. For instance, you know, nowadays people say that they can optimize over neural networks. Okay, it's a bit of a dubious claim, but still they say it. So let's take this as a, an hypothesis that we can optimize over neural networks. Now can we do bandits over neural networks? Okay, so that's, that's the, the spirit, and they have some very, very nice algorithms in that spirit. Another thing that I want to say is, is going to point to really the difficulty of bandits. So in fact, the, I didn't emphasize this, but the birth of the whole field of bandits uh, in, in the 50s when uh, Herbert Robbins was looking at it, to him it was more as a negative result than a, as a positive result. What he was saying is that look at this simplest possible model of you know, online sequential decision making, it's already almost impossible to solve. So of course we're not going to be able to develop you know, some general statistical theory of online decision making. That was Robbins' uh, point of view. And I think he, he has a, he, his point is valid. You know, there is just, you have seen like every time we change a little bit the model, we have to work really hard to get something. Statistics or in other fields, it's much easier. But here in, in, in bandit theory, it's, it's just really hard. Every time you have to work like crazy to get something. And, and I will ex uh, illustrate this one more time with an open problem that we just solved, uh, which was like this. So these people in MSR New York that works on, on these contextual bandits, they conjectured the following. Oh, this was an open problem. Open uh, court uh, 2017 problem. So the question was like this. Can you get square root of L star T times N log of the policy system? Okay, so just get this small loss, this easy data bound. Okay, we saw that in the multi-arm bandit, it was super simple. We just replaced the entropy by the log barrier. So here, of course, it's going to fail to, if you remember this calculation, just replacing uh, the entropy to get multiplicative weights, replacing it by, by, by the log barrier is going to be terrible because the size of the set, instead of, going, of being log of the size of the policy space, is going to be the size of the policy space. So this is a terrible idea. But there were other algorithms to get small loss bound, and they all fail. Okay? So you see, just a very natural question. The first time I saw that, I was like, OK, but it should be super simple. And no, it's not simple. And we had to, to develop a new technology. So the answer is yes. The answer is always you can do it. But uh, so the theorem is myself, Michael Cohen, Yuan Jili, is that uh, you can do it. Yes. Can you get? Yes.
Um, but you have to develop something really fundamentally different from this EXP4. And it's not efficient. I have no idea how to do it in the Oracle model. All of this, every time, it's, it's difficult questions. Um, maybe another thing in the direction of uh, easy data. So let's just talk about two other directions for easy data. Two directions for easy data. So maybe now is also a good time to, to you know, in the last 10 minutes, to talk about the most famous uh, bandit problem, which is the stochastic, the IID bandit problem. So if the LTs are IID, let's say with mean mu, then let me define let delta i be the gap between the mean of action i and the mean of the best action. So this is mu i minus the minimum of the mu j. Okay, so this is how much suboptimal is action i compared to the best action. Then one can get a regret which scales like log t instead of square root t times the sum of the inverse gap. Okay. So this is a theorem by our Cesar Bianchi uh, and Fisher from 2002. And this is probably the most cited uh, uh, bandit paper ever. It's very, very simple. I won't do the proof. It's called UCB. It's the most used uh, bandit algorithm uh, of all. Uh, and you get this improved bound. So if you are in the IID setting and there is some separation, then you can imagine it's pretty easy. You know, you take a bunch of samples. You, you know, estimate the, these gaps. If there is some, some real gaps, then you can stop pretty quickly, and you just get this log factor. And this is optimal. Now the question, in terms of easy data, would be, can you combine those two results. Can you have a regret, you know, which in the worst case is square root tn, but if it turns out that it comes from IID data with separation, you get this. And again, this is partially answered, but there are still nice things to be done. So, so a theorem. So this was myself with Slifkins in 2011, and then there is follow-up by Auer, Auer and Luo in uh, 15, I think, and you can also look at Seldin and Lugosi in 16. Essentially, the answer is can get simultaneously a regret of um, Simultaneously, you can get square root Tn uh, poly log T, always, and log squared T times the sum of the inverse gap, if I ID. Okay, so this is some kind of adaptation to the easiness of the data. If the data is random, then you get a better bound. Now, the, the best algorithm in terms of bound is, is our first algorithm, but it's also the most difficult. And the follow-up algorithms, they all have various weaknesses, but they are a little bit simpler. So the question is, can you recover this result with a nice algorithm, something simple, uh, something maybe even practical? Because this, to me, is a practical problem. You know, what you really want, people in applications, they will never let you implement something like multiplicative weights because it's just too uh, cautious. You know, it's trying to guard against the worst case. Whereas something like UCB, these IID algorithms, they are very aggressive. They very quickly focus on the best action. But what you really would like, I think, is something that does both. So if indeed there is, you know, some action that stands out, yes, you should focus on it and, and get a good regret. But you should also be careful that maybe, you know, there is a lot of uh, non-IIDness in the world, and what was good right now is maybe not good in the future. So this is exactly trying to do this trade-off. 
Um, another direction initiated by, uh, by Elad Hazan, and uh, so this is Hazan and Kale, or Kale, uh, in 2008, which were follow up in the same paper as the one uh, in, wait, this is not, okay, sorry, this is not me with Michael, sorry. This is uh, Zeyuan Alenju, uh, Alenju, and myself, sorry about that, and, and Lee. And, and uh, here, here is this paper. It's myself, Michael, and Yuanji in 17. So the theorem goes like this. You remember you can get small loss bound, like square root of L star. But here is what we prove. We prove that you can get a regret, in fact, which scale in square root of the variance of the losses. Variance of L1 up to L. What does it mean, the variance? The variance is just the sum of the L2 norm of LT minus the average. Okay, this is the variance. So you see in the worst case, this is of order T times N, but maybe this could be much smaller if there is a smaller variance. And there is a recent follow-up work by Haipeng uh, Luo, which says the following. You know, this is nice, but maybe you don't want, if, if there are some actions which is badly performing, which has a lot of variance, it shouldn't affect your bound. You should only care about the variance of the best action. Okay, and, and, and this guy has some bound in that, uh, in that direction. Uh, but you see, we already know a lot, but every time you move a little bit around, there are still many, many open problems. I don't think there is a general theory to be discovered, but there are still new tricks to be discovered. And then the hope is that these tricks, when people have real applications where they really care about the bandit application, they can, you know, pick in this pool of, of tricks and use the one which is most appropriate for their application. Again, I'm not saying that any of those algorithms, you can just take it and apply it uh, uh, directly. And uh, yeah, that's it. I will conclude here. Thanks. Thank you.